Well, hi, Ann Simon. It's such a pleasure to have you join us from the Virginia horse country today. I mean, you've been an education leader for multiple decades. You are the <laughs> author of <laughs> Beyond the Brochure, an insider's guide to private school elementary schools in Los Angeles. So such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Agni. It's really nice to be here. So I wanted to, you know, jump in with some questions. We had such a lovely discussion the other day that I thought so many people would benefit from your thoughts. So I wanted to start out with a little bit of what you think about, um, you know, parenting and education. Um, you know, parenting and education often goes very much hand in hand. And you specifically now as a consultant, you also are an expert in helping parents realize you know, their education philosophy and their parenting philosophy. So I wanted to you know, hear more of your thoughts on that. And you know, how do you think really parenting determines a child's education? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a very fundamental question. Um, what I have done over the years is kind of put together a way of helping parents to understand their own educational philosophy and then apply those values to their children specifically and be able to articulate what their aspirations are for their kids. Um, when I was doing a lot of helping families in Los Angeles specifically, uh, explore independent schools for admissions, I developed a, a little, I don't know, a little program that I call the family message. And every time I would start working with a couple or a parent, I would ask them to write a one piece page, one page long uh, expression of three things. And the first one was, something about their own education, where was it? But more importantly, how did they feel about it? Because a lot of people say, oh, I went to X school and it was fantastic. And some people said, you know, I really wish I'd done something different because it didn't quite fit me. So that's sort of the first piece of it. And the second part of this one page narrative is to have them express who they think their children are or child is mm -hmm. so that they have to sit and look at their children separate from their own themselves and the third part is to look at what are, to express what their aspirations are for their for their children as they go through the education system what this exercise has done is it's distilled a whole lot of values and philosophy in relationship to their family, their children and education. And as they explore schools, they then have a touchstone to come back to and they do continuously and say, oh, I didn't wanna do that, but it really helped because <laughs> they could come back over and over again and say, oh yes, well this, fits this way, but it doesn't fit that way, and so on. So I mean, that seems like, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but I'm, this seems like a wonderful exercise for any family to undertake, regardless if they're, you know, choosing an independent school, but really when they're starting to assess what do they want for their child's education. And I will, you know, repeat those three questions, because I think that's truly, you know, an excellent exercise for any family with young children. So, you know, First, it's writing out for the parents. What type of education did they receive and were they, how did they feel about it? Two, second is really looking at the child. Who do they think their child is? Their child's personality, their child's strengths. And three, what are the aspirations for their child? And that's, I, I, that's very interestingly phrased. I would ask, you know, with young children, of course, it's about the parents' aspiration for the child, right? It's, or do you think by this point, children, we're talking about elementary school children, do you think they can articulate their own aspirations at this point as well, like the child's own aspirations? Well, sometimes they can. My brother decided he wanted to be a doctor when he was eight years old. And <laughs> he never changed his mind. <laughs> so, but, and my daughter decided she wanted to be a veterinarian when she was nine years old. And she is one. So it can happen. But I think more often than, than not, 
it is the influence of the parents, mm -hmm. not the not the actual understanding of the child. Mm -hmm. My brother wanted to be a doctor because my father was a doctor. What do you think? Um, <laughs> so I think those are the kinds of things that more and more, I think that's the parents expressing their aspirations and then seeing if their children either match up with that or go in a different direction. And the trick is, or the challenge is to be able to recognize and make that discernment and then respond to it in a way that is helpful to the development of the child, both academically as well as socially and emotionally. Absolutely, now that's wonderful advice for parents. Now I wanted to ask you, because a lot of parents feel um, that you know it's really the schools or the education system that are you know kind of driving and are the main influence of of their child's education and their child's development you know, what do you think um to what extent do you think parents can really maintain their own philosophy their own you know even personal authenticity uh within you know whatever school they choose or when within, within the public education system well the idea of authenticity is very important, I think, and it goes back to that first set of values that is established when they are able to articulate and understand their own perspective toward education and toward their children. It, it really is a matter of being able to stay with that as they move through the educational system. If it's admission to an elementary school, it's being able to express to that school who they are and find the right fit for their child. If the fit's there and for the child and the family, then the authenticity isn't so difficult because it comes naturally. If there's a sense that the a, a child who doesn't let's see an example would be a child who is more of a kinesthetic learner or a, a learner who learns by movement then putting that child in a paper and pencil desks in a row kind of situation is going to make it very difficult to hang on to that authenticity and so that's where the idea of being able to understand who you are and who your child is and match that up with the educational program, whether it's an independent school, a public school, a home school, an online school, any of those schools, it's all in my mind about the fit. Absolutely. Or the extracurricular activity your child is doing. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's so many uh, wonderful enrichment programs now as well, where you can really find something that suits your child's Absolutely. You know, development and personality. And that could maybe be even more important than their day school. You know, maybe that could be the place where your child finds their true expression. That's true. Yeah. And I think that sometimes um, we talked a little bit the other day about mm -hmm. the challenge of working with gifted, quote unquote, gifted children mm -hmm. and uh, high achievers, so to speak. And sometimes children who have exceptional capacities don't want to do things in a traditional way because Absolutely. they get bored or because they're not being met most often i think they're not being met by the curriculum that's being offered to them and in and sometimes things just come too easily um i know a young man now um who has is very talented specifically mathematically and he just doesn't he doesn't take any time to do his homework because it's just it's just too it's easy he just does it and early on in his education his parents decided that they needed to find some avenue for him to be challenged to be to learn discipline to learn patience to learn teamwork all of those cooperative skills and all of those 21st century learning skills yes. that we know are so important. And he, they, he chose 
sports. And for him, his parents not only said, oh yeah, so you can go join the league basketball team. Mm -hmm. They made it part of their family mission to have that become his co-curricular avenue to develop those skills. And it wasn't easy for him because he's not tall. <laughs> and so he's been able to, but, he's, but he has developed all of those skills through the course of his education while still obviously doing very well academically in school. That's just one example of the kind of parallel experience a child can have that will help them be engaged, learn the value of certain elements that they're going to need regardless of how advanced they may be as they move into higher education and into the world. Absolutely, and I can really, you know, this um, example really, you know, strikes a chord with me because, um, you know, I can share my own two children. So my own two children, you know, play classical piano, you know, at, a, at a qu quite a high level. And a lot of people often ask me, well, is it because you want them to become musicians? Do you want them to become concert pianists? And frankly, no, the motivation for, you know, our family from the start was that the piano for them would be their vehicle to learn discipline, to learn hard work, to learn excellence, uh, not necessarily the, you know, actual results of the piano themselves. I mean, now, of course, they, you know, um, they play beautifully, they perform, but it's those other values that to me are more important. And I definitely view this as part of their education, that co-curriculum, as you called it. So I think, you know, this is, you know, absolutely excellent when parents are thinking about their child's education. And there's the curriculum in school, there's the academic curriculum. What is the other co-curriculum they're getting to right. develop their strengths um, or, you know, improve some of their maybe weak areas that they have? Well, I wanted to ask you, you know, about this, um, the learner mindset. Um, you know, it's, as we know, some kids, you know, they just seem to love to learn. They're very self-motivated. They love, whether it's school or whether it's a particular passion they have, let's say, you know, whether it's, again, the piano or, I don't know, science. And other, other children seem, seem to, you know, be, you know, less interested, don't seem to, and parents wonder, how should I motivate my child? I mean, having worked again with, you know, in some of the, the finest schools on the West Coast, uh, what would be your advice as an education leader to a parent in terms of developing that learner mindset? Well, I think the first thing is to create an environment that models that and offers an opportunity to children to explore a learning experience that is developmentally matched to their age. Um, you hear from organizations and, and places like Head Start and preschools that people should start reading to their children when they're still in the womb. And I'm not sure that's not a good idea. <laughs> I think that there's some, there may be, you know, we play music to them, we can, we can read to them too. But more, pointedly having books around from the time that they're little, um, having books that they can touch, that's where the soft books come in. And later that they can see, that's where the big books come in. And we've developed all of these strategies in elementary education to be able to meet the child where they are. And so meeting the child where they are in an environment that is full of those kinds of visual, uh, auditory, and real experiences being read to every night or having a family uh, tradition of having storybooks that are going ongoing, even if you're too young and your older siblings are listening to your parents read some chapter book or some novel, that kind of experience, that kind of input gets in there and it doesn't go away. My mom, and my, my, my example is that my mom was a theater major at Pomona College a gazillion years ago. <laughs> and 
she was not on stage. She never wanted to be on stage. She was a set designer because she was also an artist. And her philosophy in parenting, and my father picked this up pretty strongly as well, was hmm. set the stage. Set the stage so that the activity that you want to happen can happen optimally. And that happened in, I, as I think back on it, it happened in every area of my life. It certainly happened in their choice of a school for me and my three brothers, um, because the, 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 our family and Chadwick were like seamless, seriously, <laughs> the whole time I was growing up and I was there for 12 years. So wow. it was almost like, there was no difference between home and school. And I think that has become, I think that was the influence of the neighborhood school for a lot of people in the public school system. I think it's been the influence for homeschooling in many ways and enrichment, online enrichment classes that kids are gravitate toward. All of that is about having set a context that can support the growth of the child. So are you saying essentially it's, you know, the, the learning environment has to become like home to the children. They have, is that what you're saying? Uh, <laughs> yes, it, yeah. I think it, in a sense, it's like home if home mm -hmm. is a place where there is, are basic things that are needed, conditions for growth. The first one being physical and psychological safety. Nothing, nobody's home if they don't have that. And then you start adding to those ideas. Once you have that, you can look at what are the aspirations that you have? What are the expectations you have for that child's learning and development? And from there, you can talk about how to achieve that. And there's many, many layers to that conversation that lead to having the environment that embodies those conditions for growth. Absolutely. You know, I, I loved your, you know, this imagery of really setting the stage for your children, you know, setting the stage for learning for a learner. I mean, and naturally books um, and having books around you know, that we have that at home. Uh, there's another thing we do. I mean, we have uh, almost dedicated our you know, whole wall to crafts. I mean, it's giant shelves of art and craft supplies because I just wanted this to be very accessible to my children. You know, it's, uh, they can just go in. My mother's, my, my mother's an artist as well. She's a painter. Yeah. So, you know, the arts are very important and I just want the kids to have easy access to it. What are some other ideas you think? Um, how, what other ways do you think parents could set the stage uh, in their home? Well, I think once they start to know who they're, figure out who their children are. Mm -hmm. And I do think there are some natural inclinations that come mm -hmm. along with them. Yes. Um, uh, in, our, in our family, in my family, my kids were interested in animals from day one whether it was a kitten, a puppy, or a frog, it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, it, and that was a deep interest and abiding interest in me. I was, I was a farmer inside living in Palos Verdes, you know, it was, not, <laughs> it, it was easy when I was less than six, but at six years old, everything kind of changed and everybody, everything grew up around us. So when I was starting to try to honor who my children were, I moved to the country and I got a little ranch in Mendocino County and we had a whole lot of animals. And as I look back on it now, I remember in our backyard in Palos Verdes, my mother let us have ducks, chickens, <laughs> rabbits. I couldn't have my horse at home because it wasn't allowed. <laughs> uh, we always had a dog 
she was allergic to cats so they had to stay outside <laughs> so i mean that was the way that that happened for me and that happened for my children and in addition to that it was the adventures that we went on as a family that helped me have experiences that also develop those interests and passions hmm. um and i knew by the time i was eight or nine that i wanted to be a country girl somehow some someday somehow well it's so interesting i'm gonna have to it's a little bit of a side question but you know you were a country girl at heart you loved animals you loved life on the farm how did you end up at columbia in new york city <laughs> at an ivy league i mean that's a lot of parents i think would be like you know, oh, if I'm going to raise a, you know, a child in the farm, on the farm in the country, they're going to want to, you know, stay yeah. there. <laughs> well, of course, it's a long story, but to kind of distill it down, a very big part of me was influenced by Margaret Chadwick. I happened to be lucky enough to literally sit at her knee for many occasions as I was growing up. and. I, she was my AP English teacher when I was a senior. Um, so she became, I'll, a, I'll, I'll, yeah. Just if for folks who don't know, so Margaret Chadwick was the founder of the Chadwick School, you know, one right. of the most, uh, you know, wonderful, uh, prestigious um, schools and, you know, across the United States, one of the independent schools. Right. When we were, um, seniors and we were it, we had to put together an anthology for one of our projects and it was all english literature but there was a lot of writing assignments along with it too and one night she sent us home with the uh, assignment to write a one page autobiography which is why i think now that i think about it that's why i did that one page family message <laughs> And I sat down at my desk. It was it was tradition in our family. Well, no, it was a rule in our family that we had dinner and then everybody went to wherever they did their homework. And I did my homework in my own room. Uh, at about 7.15 at night, we would start that process. And I sat down at my desk and I said, how can I possibly do this? And I had an experience for the first time, and I've had it many times since, of having something just kind of come through me and out my hand. Um, and what I remember about that one page autobiography was talking about knowing when I was very young that someday I had to give back the love that was given to me by the teachers and people who cared for me in my school. And Incredible. that's the stuff that doesn't go away. It drives you. Um, I wanted to come, my brother went to Yale. I wanted to go to Yale, but they didn't accept women yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was furious. <laughs> um, but anyway, I ended up at Columbia at Teachers College for my master's degree and it couldn't have been a better fit for me. I was, I loved being in New York. It was the late sixties. It was a wonderful time to be in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really established who I was both as part of my family and upbringing and also as separate from it. What an incredible story. <laughs> Um, and I think there's a lot of gold nuggets in there for parents. Uh, yeah, well, I, I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, so how would you advise uh, parents and families to help find their child's, uh, you know, passion or talent? Um, you know, part of it, as you wrote, is, you know, really trying to understand who your child is, is but uh, how would you help that process? And specifically, you know, how do you see their strengths that you should help develop? Well, I think it's it starts with the parents' own work, <laughs> their work on themselves, honestly. Um, and I, I'm still doing this, and my kids are in their are 50. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we all have projections that we place on our children. And the longer I've lived, the more I see that a lot of the process of understanding and knowing your child is the process of peeling back 
those projections and being able to see your child separate from you. Um, and I, so I think that's a big part of it is to, yes, I think it's wonderful to have your child want to go to the same school you went to or be able to follow in the footsteps of your grandfather because you couldn't or something, any of those kinds of stories. But more than that, I think it's a matter of stepping back just a little and watching, observing the interests and the things that your child is drawn to, and then understanding, figuring out ways to support those interests and what the underlying curriculum is that's going on there. Um, and I'm thinking again about certainly becoming a doctor or becoming a veterinarian is a very academic process. Um, Absolutely. But the experience of being passionate about those things is not academic at all. And that understanding, I think, I don't think my father ever cared whether, well, I don't know whether he cared if my brother was <laughs> a doctor or not, but he didn't, he, it wasn't something he pushed. Um, and I didn't really particularly push it with my daughter. It was just there. And it was something that had to be respected. I think respected is, is really a good mm. word, actually. Mm. The other part of it is that I do believe that parents really are responsible to offer their children opportunities to acquire the skills necessary to be able to flush out those interests and passions. And that's where mm -hmm. the balance between the emotional and social part and the academic skill development comes in because it's wonderful to be passionate about being a doctor, but if you don't know anything about science, it's not gonna work very well, et cetera. So, it's, a, it's again, it's that knowing your child and at the same time being clear that there are basic needs and skill development sets that need to be acquired through the kind of partnership really in a sense that needs to be set up between parents and their children to say, okay, maybe I'm not crazy about math right now, but my parents think this is important and they're going to keep challenging me to have it be important. So I better get into it. That happens a lot. And I think it's an important piece. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think you hit it, you know, on the nail. It's really, I mean, well, I love how you highlight on the one hand, it's the passion, but then it's the reality of, you know, the skill sets that you need to help your child, you know, pursue those passions. And That's it's the right. parent's responsibility, really, of a you know committed, loving parent to help a child acquire those skills, mm -hmm. um, and really, truly having that partnership. I mean, that's the ideal world. Word, you know, if you could have a partnership uh, with your child, and your child can see. I mean, you math again. You know, I mean, it's too common for many people to say, "Oh, I don't like you know many kids. I don't like math." But math is such a foundational subject for many fields. So let's say if you don't develop your skills sufficiently in math, many of the fields will be closed off to you, you know, medicine, even, um, mm -hmm. you know, architecture, sciences, technology. So, I mean, that's a wonderful, wonderful advice. I also enjoyed last time we spoke, you know, you talked about the confidence and competence. Uh, so uh, if you could, uh, you know, touch on that again and how that really, you know, creates um, potentially, you know, a child's interest in something. Yeah, um, when I moved from California to Virginia, which is now 25 years ago. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I decided to go back in the classroom after I had been mm -hmm. doing a lot of administrative work. Mm -hmm. And I ended up at the Hill School in Middleburg, Virginia. And the, the credo of Hill School is 
competence, confidence, and community. And I see that as the basic triad of development because, and it's, it's circular. Well, <laughs> it's triangular <laughs> uh, <laughs> because each one of them feeds the other. And if you have confidence, then the, co the competence is at the avenues are more open. And with community, you were able to have this social reinforcement of that confidence and competence along the way. So if you make a triangle with one of those words on each side, you can also put right next to community, you can put social, right next to confidence, you can put emotional, and right next to competence, you can put academic. Wow. So I see that as kind of the, the triumvirate of education. Mm -hmm. So competence to, uh, so competence would be academic. Competence or... would be academic. Okay. Confidence. Community, community so, would be social. Social, yes. And, and confidence is confidence emotional. Would be emotional. Oh, absolutely wonderful! This so is a have wonderful the social, framework. emotional, and academic mm -hmm. corners of the triangle. Absolute. That's a wonderful way for folks to think about it, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I think so, that I was thinking of when I was thinking about that earlier today. I thought hmm, that could be a nice little graphic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm going to put up a nice graphic for this. This is great. So do you think, to what extent do you think, uh, since we're talking about competence and skills, um, you know, there's a big debate right now whether, you know, there has been kind of an under, you know, competence, let's say, has been underrated. If uh, we have lowered, in fact, academic expectations from children, uh, whether the education system has lowered academic expectations. But, you know, at the same time within this debate, others actually believe the opposite, that in fact, children are facing too much pressure today, too much stress. Um, what, what are your thoughts on it? Having, you know, also seen, you know, so many decades of, uh, yeah. you know, the different evolutions and cycles that we've had in educational philosophy. Unfortunately, or for, I think they're both true. I think that standards have been lowered to some extent, and I think stress and pressure is an issue. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, the... How is that? Can you walk us well, through it? I think that lowered expectations are a result of the fear that probably kids, that children, but also their parents have a fear of failure. And we've become a very achievement oriented culture. Mm. And the stress and the pressure also is a result of a fear of failure. So they both have the same root. And that is a very challenging thing to kind of take on and figure out how to get beyond. And it makes me need to sit back and say, okay, what is success? If that's what we're afraid of not having, what is it that we will give us that? And how do we step back and retool what we're doing in order to have the academic expectations that we would like to see and also we know are needed to be able to excel and at the same time not have kids blowing out because they're so stressed yes um and i go back again I mean, it's, it gets to be a little bit like a broken record. Um, <laughs> I go back again to the issue of authenticity and balance and knowing your child and understanding that and the triangle of competence, comp confidence and community and seeing all that more as an organic process rather than a linear one. I think mm. we get in trouble when we start to see it as linear and it can go in either direction. It can go with lowered expectations and it can go with pr toward pressure and, and stress, 
and it can go toward both in the same person. So it's a very complex situation. So how, help us, so how do we think of it not as a linear, but as an organic process? You know, this, uh, the learning, the acquiring, the skill sets, the, the achievement. Uh, I, it, it goes back to the, the modeling of the environment. Um, the headmaster at the Hill School, when I arrived there, one of the talks he gave once was he said, you know, reading should be like chewing gum. <laughs> we went, what? <laughs> chewing gum? Reading? And he said, yeah, my kids and his, his kids were in either graduate school or out of school by that point. He said, they used to come home in high school and read their children's picture books that they'd had <laughs> because they remembered them so fondly and they liked the stories and they got something different out of them when they were 15 than they had when they were seven. And that made perfect sense to me. So the idea that learning becomes something that is just an everyday thing and a part of, and there's no particular, it, it is in its, it's, it's, it's its own reward. It becomes its own reward. Mm. And that's mm. where we talk about creating lifelong learners yes. and all yes. of that thing. So um, it's not really a those, destination. Learning is not a destination. It's a process. It's, it's part of your life. Exactly. Yeah. So you touched on such a key point, you know, this fear of failure um, that we have as a society, um, I think as parents, uh, particularly, um, and that we transfer to our children and the children have a fear of failure. Can you talk more about that? I mean, isn't, you know, failure part of education, part of growing up? Sure. I think failure is very important. Um, successes build confidence. Failures, when they are approached non judgmentally and as learning, as lessons or course corrections, build resilience. And if we've learned anything in the last however many years, it's that oh, yes. resilience is something we all need to have in spades. So to me, the idea of being able to make a mistake and I wanna say, have it be okay. And what I mean mm. by that is that it's not judged as failure. A mistake and failure are not the same thing. And they have become synonymous in many people's minds. And that's dangerous for children, very dangerous. Yes. So, and, and mistake so put, is not failure. It's not, right. Right? right? right. My dad was a sailor and I learned a lot about course corrections <laughs> from him. <laughs> and I remember putting that kind of as to metaphor together. And I think it's a good one because there's so many times when you're walking down whatever your path in life is that you say, uh oh, and you can say, oh, I've blown it, I've failed. But you can also say, wait a minute, I don't wanna do that anymore. So let's do this instead. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Failure has to be dealt with without judgment. And mm. when that becomes the case, then the stress diminishes, the ability to up the expectations ex comes in because they're not gonna get blasted if they don't quite meet them. And the concept of personal best comes into play. And that's Absolutely. another part of it. Absolutely. But you know, the parents often feel the stakes are so high, right? Um, for their children. Um, and I think that's where some of these fears come in as we discuss. Sure. So, you know, as someone who graduated from an Ivy League, who, who worked at the schools that are, you know, essentially feeders for Ivy Leagues, uh, um, what advice would you give um, to parents, uh, you know, of elementary school students, you know, we're speaking about young children still, you know, who really want to set up their child for an Ivy League education without this, as we discussed, you know, without the fear of failure, you know, with creating right. that learner mindset. Right. Um, I go back to knowing your child. Uh, if you know 
your child's strengths, emotional strengths, strengths of interest, cognitive strengths, you can begin to put together a path for that child to acquire the necessary skills that he or she will need to be able to perform, I use that word pointedly, perform academically. And mm. that process goes again back to being able to see your child for who they are rather than who you'd like them to be. Um, and also follow them. There's the, you know, Maria Montessori was the person who said, follow the child. And everybody interpreted that 40 years ago as mean, you know, watch them run across the field and think that that means they're going to go to Yale. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. <laughs> but it does mean that if you see that your child is interested in a particular direction, you want to promote that so that they learn, they be, are able to understand the value of excellence. Like you said earlier, the value of hard work, the skill sets that are necessary to have the achievement that they need so that they will have the choices to go to whatever school they, they go to. Having said that, I don't know how many times in my career, <laughs> in my careers, <laughs> I have said, you know, there are a whole lot of really good schools that are not in the Ivy League. Um, Stanford comes to mind, but that's another <laughs> that could be. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, you know, there are many, many, if, I, if my child is a small school person, I was a small school person. And that was partly because I was in a small school for 12 years and I wasn't ready to go to Duke or a large, I wasn't ready to go to Berkeley. It would have been too big for me emotionally. I needed to be in a smaller environment. That might rule out an Ivy League school for some kids. Some, some students, know by the time they're in high school that they really want a technological um, career. And I think the reintroduction of yes. vocational kinds of programs is a very positive thing for education in that way. So again, it goes back to know your child, then be able to follow them while making sure that they get what they need to be able to manifest those interests and, and experiences and passions. No, I loved it. I mean, it's uh, when you said follow the child, but it's not follow the child, you know, uh, into cartoon watching or, <laughs> or video games. <laughs> or video games. Um, yep, you know, it's you have really to figure out exactly because I do not understand video games, I will <laughs> honestly admit. Um, I have yet to figure out exactly what the value is. I'm, well, I'm working on it. Some, some say there's a value. Some say there's I a value. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm open. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you of another kind of big debate here, another concern for parents and I think educators. Um, really this, um, you know, idea, there's so, so much of the idea that, you know, learning should be fun. Um, that, you know, learning should be entertainment. Um, and to what extent do you think, you know, the lines between education and entertainment are getting blurred today? Um, and what do you think about that? Is that a problem? Is that a positive? Um, shouldn't learning be fun? Uh, ideally, I'd love it to be fun. <laughs> but I don't think that should be the goal. Um, the goal is engagement. And I think engagement has become confused mm. with entertainment. Mm. We've tried, we've, we have also been somewhat co-opted by the entertainment <laughs> world, not even just in Los Angeles, everywhere. <laughs> yes, across um, the world, you know, I speak with families across absolutely. the world and it's honestly, um, you know, that, that's the trend. 
it's not just theatrical entertainment. It's also mm -hmm. the, the entertainment of sports, the entertainment of all kinds of different kinds of entertainment. Um, and what we really need to think about instead of fun is engagement. What is it that we can do with our educational methodologies and systems that will support that? Because if kids are engaged, they're gonna be having fun. Um, maybe not the kind of fun they have playing a video game, um, but the kind yes. of fun they feel when they're great gaining in confidence and competence. Mm. That's a good feeling for anybody. And that will be interpreted in the long run. That becomes what is satisfying and rewarding. And that comes pretty close to being fun in my mind. Absolutely, absolutely. How much do you think education has changed uh, over the last couple of years uh, because of COVID? What longer term impact do you think this will have? And here I'm speaking about there are several things. I mean, one, of course, is the, you know, the children, the isolation, the missing out on school that kids have experienced, but also so much of it moving towards, you know, technology, ed tech. Um, and I'm wondering even to, you know, this is becoming a very long question, so you can, you know, answer whatever part you want. But, you know, to what extent even the older debates between progressive versus traditional education you know, to what extent that even matters so much today as we're seeing such more rapid changes that maybe anything that was progressive, what we consider progressive education in the past is already, you know, traditional education. Well, that's what I was actually going to start with. Hmm. Was that I've watched schools like Chadwick um, and other schools that I know relatively well that have been thought of as being traditional move no not move toward incorporate many mm. progressive mm. methodologies and strategies because they've learned that they work they've learned that they're good for children and they've learned that it's important for children to have the social and emotional piece that goes along with their growth as well as the skill development piece and i think that has been happening for 20, 25 years, maybe. Yeah. Um, certainly it's happened during my, my career lifetime. Uh, so where we used to say, and to some extent we still can, there are schools that are progressive or even methodological like uh, Reggio or Montessori mm -hmm. or Waldorf. Um, and their schools that are traditional, most of those schools incorporate something from the others. And that has been happening over time. When we came into, first we started hitting the technology reality. Yes. And we started to bring technology into the classroom and into the school environment and figure out what was necessary for kids to learn, how could they use it, how could we in, in, enhance the classroom experience with it, um, all of those things. And that was moving along pretty well, in my opinion, before quite a few years before we had to deal with the pandemic and COVID. What I think the experience of the last couple of years has given us is a crash course in needing to evaluate, well, two things. First of all, seeing mm -hmm. that there can be a lot of value in having technology being a fundamental and primary part of someone's education. Um, and it also has made us have to jump in and quickly. I mean, I think about all the teachers who've had to turn around and in the blink of an eye, change everything about how they've been teaching a public school class. And there've been many times when I've said to 
friends of mine who are still in the in the business <laughs> I'm really glad I don't have to make those decisions anymore because <laughs> it's it it's been it's been hard it's been hard for teachers it's been hard for administrators um and it's also been pretty revolutionary I think uh, and I don't think revolutionary, right? Mm. I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's creating all kinds of new benefits for families, for learning styles, for all of those things. Um, but I think it's going to take a, t a while to sort it all out and having it be forced on us in the way that it has been, it has also created a lot of awareness and concerns about social development and how do we have our kids mm -hmm. still maintain their friendships and do we let them have online friendships that seem to them and I've heard this said by my grandchildren by other children what do you mean I don't have any friends I have a <laughs> whole bunch of friends they're in my blah blah group <laughs> you know? seriously and and they to them those are real relationships they're mm. not abstract yes um we we have to deal with that we have to figure out what that really means in terms of their own development their own psychological development and it also how's it going to be applied in the world I think about, a, and this doesn't have to do with technology, but it's, but it, it's somewhat tangentially related. Um, when I was raising my kids in Mendocino County on a little ranch, there was a family in town who homeschooled their four boys. Hmm. That I don't think those boys ever went to school. Um, they were all high, very high achievers. Mm. Um, one of them became, I think, well, I know he's a doctor, but I don't know exactly. For a while, he was doing Doctors Without Borders. He was doing all mm. kinds of interesting things in world mm. health. Uh, one of them became an artist. One of them, you know, they, they went in very many different directions with excellent educations. What their parents did very wisely was they made 4-H their social experience and of course also their animal experience. 4-H. 4-H, mm. yes. The 4-H Club of America mm. um, is wonderful for kids who live in a more rural setting mm. who mm -hmm. have the opportunity to be a part of an organization that feeds their skill development, develops their interests, teaches them values of heart, hard work, all of that kind of thing, and gives kids a chance to be together. So these boys raised, you know, champion goats <laughs> and knew everything about genetics that you needed to know about goats mm. by the time they were 12. <laughs> Oh, wow. And, you know, all of those kinds of things that are then translatable skills that they can use to be an artist or to be a doctor or whatever. So somewhere in that story is a lesson that I think we need to hold on to as we move further into the world of technology in mm. education, is that when we do that, we still need to find and have kids have the experience of something that gives them that social interaction face to face and mm. body to body not over the mm. screen mm. the community really the com the sense right. of still community one of the three pillars or or exactly. or triangle or trifecta no absolutely Oh, and this has been so, so interesting. I mean, and as you said, I think, you know, well, the future really is here already. I think over the last couple of years, we jumped 10 years into the future in terms of what education is, in terms of technology, 
we're not going back. There's no going back, I think, after this. Um, but we still have to see and have to have, I'd say, you know, the cream rise to the top and things to sort themselves out as mm -hmm. we are in this already, you know, brave new world. You know, as, uh, as we wrap up, I wanted to ask if there's anything else you would like to tell parents, any sort of um, piece of advice, final advice that you think uh, you'd like to share with them? What I, what I feel when you ask that question mm. is wanting to have some way to have parents be able to both participate in and enjoy the growth of their children. Yes, it's a job to be a parent. It is a hard job. Mm. But I, I think that the best way for our children to end up being both successful and happy adults is success meaning whatever it means to them, to, to their parents, <laughs> um, is to have that experience also be warm and loving and communicative and knowing. And that gets it gets lost so easily sometimes because it's also hard when you're trying to be all of the things that a parent needs to be for their children. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the most difficult job. I think most people will agree being a parent is the most difficult job you can undertake. So I wanted to thank you so much, so much for your time and today. This was a wonderful discussion. I think there's so many gold nuggets here. I would recommend parents just watch and rewatch this because <laughs> um, they'll get so, um, I think many words of wisdom to how to really think about supporting their child and having that partnership with their child that we discussed to help their child uh, you know, set them up for the, the best, uh, you know, the best opportunities um, and the possibilities in life. So again, I wanted to thank you so much and I hope we'll chat again soon. I hope so too. Thank you. And I really appreciate your leadership in moving in this new direction and trying to suss out all of these different pieces uh, that need to be discerned as we move forward. And I am very, very interested in, and happy to see that happening. So oh, thanks. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time then. All right. All right. Uh, well, when I was driving yesterday through the beautiful countryside around here, I passed several schools and I keep looking to see if their car is in the parking lot or not because that tells me a lot about what's happening in terms of online education for that area. And these are public schools that I'm talking about. And it occurred to me, these are big brick buildings with two or three stories. And you think, where are the children? <laughs> and it made me realize again, how important it is that we completely rethink education in general. I think we have an opportunity at this time because we've been launched into this new technologically enhanced approach and opportunity, we've been put in a position that we can take a huge step both back and forward at the same time. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know what it's going to look like, uh, but I know it shouldn't look the same and it shouldn't have a bunch of big brick buildings that kids are sitting in, in chairs. Mm. That doesn't mean they should be running across the field either. It just <laughs> means that there's got to, I think there are going to necessarily be different ways of structuring education to achieve the kind of goals that are gonna to need to be achieved for the world that we live in. Entertain us, what would be that step, that step forward? What would, could be that possible alternative? And I can say for me, I really feel that it's about personalization. 
I mean, we really right now we personalize everything, you know, our our phones, our, you know, entertainment, our, you know, we can personalize our shoes, you know, I mean, they're every element that's can be really personalized good. in our life, but our education and, and, you know, for children, and it's feasible today, it's really feasible to have a very personalized education. Mm-hmm. It's just maybe mm-hmm. it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't gone mainstream yet. Right. And I think that's part of what I mean when I say about, when I talk about knowing your child, mm-hmm. that's part, I think that's the goal of knowing your child is being able to personalize what their experience in, in, whether it's school or no school, not school, um, personalize it in a way that really fits optimally for them. Uh, but I don't know that we know yet what kind of form it can take. Mm-hmm. Like you said a few minutes ago, the idea that people are forming pods. I know mm-hmm. families that have bonded together because one family has a stay at home mom and the other family doesn't or is a single parent and they have helped each they've supported each other in getting through this time of covid when they've had to adjust everything about how they deal with their work life as well as their kids school life Mm. Um, and i think that many of them have seen the advantages i've heard numerous people say i'm not going back they don't know what they're going toward yet. Yes. And I think that's what we have to, I don't think we've even really got a vision for it quite yet. I think that's coming. And because I'm not in the, in the trenches anymore, <laughs> um, I don't feel like I have my ear to the ground of, on what the conversations are that are going on among educational leaders and also even among parents to some extent to to figure out what that vision can be. I know it won't be singular. And that again, goes back to the personalization part. I think there'll be many different modalities and that's gonna create more choice and that's gonna require more discernment. And that's all going to have to be attended to as we move into this new era.